great. Good morning. Um, apologies for not using my video. Um, unfortunately, my internet does not allow frequently for both to happen at the same time. Um, so our presentation is related to sustained release interferon gamma um, in neuroblastoma and how M1 tumor associated macrophages suppress tumor growth in this neuroblastoma model. So the focus of our lab is on neuroblastoma, which is the most common pediatric solid extracranial malignancy with over 700 cases that are diagnosed each year in the United States. This represents about 7% of all pediatric cancers that are diagnosed and 15% of all pediatric cancer mortality. Uh, therapy is dependent upon staging, which includes surgical resection when possible and induction chemotherapy. Carboplatin, cyclophosphamide are some examples of the chemotherapies used. Um, and this is followed by myeloablative therapy and hematopoietic stem cell transplant and immunotherapy. So to give some background on immunotherapy in neuroblastoma, anti-GD2 is the agent currently in use in the treatment of neuroblastoma after cytoreductive therapy. Dicyaloganglioside, or GD2, which you can see here depicted in the red box, is expressed during fetal development, and it's also present in mature neurons and skin cells. A randomized control trial in 2010 involving anti-GD2, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, changed the standard of care for neuroblastoma. This study showed prolonged event-free event survival and overall survival for over two years in patients receiving anti-GD2 as part of maintenance therapy compared to the standard of care alone. However, the efficacy has only been observed in patients with minimal residual disease and not in patients with bulky neuroblastoma. So this highlighted a main question for us of how can we harness immunomodulating agents in patients with bulky disease? And so now to focus on an effector cell, the macrophage, uh, that we here want to discuss then the role of the tumor-associated macrophages in, um, in, in cancer. So the tumor microenvironment has a major role in transforming mac mac macrophages into different phenotypes. So the M1 phenotype, which you see here on the left, is a type of tumor-associated macrophage that's known as a classically activated macrophage. It's known to have anti-tumoral activity versus the M2 alternatively activated state of macrophages, which is there on the right. Uh, these are depicted with their associated activators and markers. And research in this field is quite active in determining the presence of tumor-associated macrophages in tumors and the likelihood of progression versus tumor regression. But one issue, however, is the seesaw-like balance seen between these two different subtypes where the macrophages can switch back, switch back and forth. Um, it may confer tumor resistance to immunomodulating agents in chemotherapy. Uh, there are multiple ways to select for an M1 phenotype in benchtop models, such as toll-like receptor agonists, but one of the most well-known ones is interferon gamma. There's been some research that has been performed to understand the role of M1 macrophages in neuroblastoma specifically. So work recently done out of the Ohio State utilized locally delivered mesenchymal stromal cells, or MSCs, capable of secreting, secreting interferon gamma in an immunocompromised model with xenografted human neuroblastoma. They found that interferon gamma, which is the curve there in blue, prolonged survival as compared to control, uh, which is the PBS in red, or liposomal clodronate, which ab ablates the macrophages, which is there in green. Clodronate also appears to attenuate interferon gamma's survival effect, which is there in the purple curve. So to determine how interferon gamma acts, the authors looked at M1 and M2 markers and found that interferon gamma treatment induced M1 markers in the tumor microenvironment, which is there marked within that box. So given this finding, we wanted to determine what the effect was in our immunocompetent model of neuroblastoma, utilizing a specially formulated sustained release interferon gamma that does not involve a complicated cell transfection system. So in order to do so, we generated a novel method for impregnating silk films with various chemical agents to achieve a sustained release of a drug from this platform, which we've worked with in the past neuro, uh, for neuroblastoma models. Silk is an optimal agent to use given its relatively inert profile in the body, like how a silk suture is used in surgery. So on the left, this schematic here demonstrates the method by which we are able to generate these small films used to implant into tumors. Uh, for this work, introducing interferon gamma to a silk film had not previously been done, so we needed to perform a release assay, which is there on the right, in order to confirm the amount that would be released over time. Three different concentrations that you see there of interferon gamma were loaded onto the silk films, which are represented by the blue, orange, and gray curves. A colorimetric release assay suggested that there was an initial burst release up to the first three days, followed by a sustained release measured over 20 days. We then carried out our testing of interferon gamma in vivo using our previously established model for allografts and xenografts. 
For this work, we utilized wild type immunocompetent C57 black six mice and the 9464 mouse neuroblastoma cell line. This cell line is a mouse derived neuroblastoma that's well established in the literature, originating from spontaneous tumors from Th mic and transgenic mice on black six background. So to confirm that the doses at which we would introduce interferon gamma required immune cells to halt cell growth, we incubated the cell line 9464D in vitro with interferon gamma alone, which by itself did not induce cell death. So mice then underwent injection of these cells into the left adrenal, followed by biweekly ultrasound to monitor tumor size. And when the tumor was measured to be 100 millimeters cubed, it was time to implant our silk films. So here's an image of the adrenal tumor prior to intervention, which was on the prior slide. And here's an image of the tumor with the implanted silk. So to determine what kind of impact interferon gamma had on tumor growth, we continued ultrasound assessment and determined how many days it took to reach a given tumor size, which is here on the y-axis, which you see there. So at 500 millimeters cubed, all concentrations of interferon appeared to have an effect on slowing tumor growth. Tumors with the control film took five days to reach the size, which is shown in the white bar, whereas up to two micrograms of interferon took up to eight days, depicted in the darkest gray color. Any amount of interferon gamma appeared to slow the growth of the tumor, given that all doses were significantly different from control at this tumor size. So when looking at these tumors, uh, oh, sorry, and then <laughs> at uh, 600 micrometers, or sorry, millimeters cubed here, uh, the control film was fastest to reach this point with two micrograms of interferon taking the most amount of time to reach the size. So the one microgram was also significantly different compared to control. For 700 micrometer, or millimeters cubed, two microgram had the most pronounced effect in slowing tumor growth compared to control, which is 10 days versus six days. And then finally at 800 millimeters cubed, two micrograms continued to have the most significant effect compared to control. Um, and even the lowest dose of interferon at slowing the tumor growth in vivo. At the earlier tumor sizes, there's an initial burst of interferon release, if you remember from our in vitro release curve. However, as we proceed past that initial burst release into our true sustained release pattern, we see the emergence of dose dependence with two micrograms having the most prominent longer lasting effect on slowing tumor growth. And so now when we're looking at these tumors after h &E staining, you can see here a control tumor on the left, which shows a uniform sheet of neuroblastoma cells as compared to the image on the right, which had a field of tumor necrosis that's adjacent to the film, which is in the upper right-hand corner of the photo. At 100x magnification, there appears to be a greater confluence of macrophages when an interferon gamma impregnated film was introduced as compared to a control film, and these macrophages are indicated by the black arrows here. So then to characterize the phenotype of the macrophages we saw in our tumors on histology, we ran RT-PCR with a number of macrophage markers to understand what these macrophages are. So for emphasis here, you can see TNF, IL-1B, IL-6, CD36, and CCR7 were all significantly upregulated in the interferon gamma exposed tumors as compared to the control, which is in the white bar versus the blue. The near double to six-fold increase seen in these macrophage markers suggests that there's an increased number of M1 phenotype macrophages in the tumor treated with interferon as compared to a control film. So in summary, we've shown that we can generate a sustained release system using, utilizing interferon gamma on a silk film. It can be used in vivo on an immunocompetent mouse model of neuroblastoma to, sh to slow tumor growth. And finally, the mechanism underlying this tumor suppression is likely related to switching tumor-associated macrophages to an M1 phenotype. Our future aims include combining interferon gamma with chemotherapy to determine optimal timing of chemotherapy and an immunomodulator. Thank you to our collaborators and thank you all for listening. Happy to take any questions. All right, great. Um, I have, I don't see any in the margin, and so I'm just gonna ask you um, about any toxicity issues with interferon gamma. Why did you top out at, at two micrograms? Was it uh, toxicity related? Was it some other reason? Um, so in terms of looking at the literature, in terms of the doses that we could expect to um, give to the mice, um, toxicity was certainly one of the related factors, but also there is um, a maximum dose at which we can top out to present into the silk film and load. So it was one of the doses that the 0.5, 1, and two micrograms were the doses that we started off with as kind of our go-tos. Um, and then and the in vivo system actually found that it did end up working out okay. Um, and, but as far as toxicity is concerned, um, in, uh, in the 
um, in patients who are treated with interferon gamma, um, pain is one of the biggest side effects that unfortunately these patients experience. Um, it's a little bit harder to assess in the mice, but they actually seem to tolerate the interferon gamma films quite well. And um, we think that's related to the fact that this is a, um, a locally implanted film as opposed to um, a system where it's, um, it's presented uh, systemically. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, uh, let's see, we have a question from Chuck Chan. Very nice study, he says. Do you have an idea on how the macrophages might be inhibiting tumor growth? For instance, is there evidence that the macrophages are phagocytosing the tumor via CD47 dependent mechanism? Uh, yeah, that's something that we hope to do next to figure out how specifically in neuroblastoma to see if it's related to some of the other tumor models that have been seen. I mean, I think with regards to the histology that we've seen, we can see macrophages on the edge of the tumor necrosis fields. Um, that said, we sort of looked at it at one time point of when the tumors reached a certain size. Um, so it's mostly kind of a size-based time point. Um, but that's definitely something that we'd be interested in looking at in future study. Okay, great. One last question. This is from Dr. Norton. It seems like the anti-tumor results were significant, but may not be clinically relevant. Did you do any survival studies, and have you measured IL-12 in the system? Great work, he says. Great. Thanks, Dr. Norton. So for IL-12, that's definitely something that we should look at, so thank you for that suggestion. Um, so for survival, uh, the, the method by which we um, in our lab typically look at these studies to figure out um, the mechanism is we need to, you know, unfortunately make sure that these mice are still alive. So we go up to a certain uh, tumor size point of um, 1000 millimeters cubed to make sure that we can sort of capture what the tumors look like as opposed to um, to something like a survival curve. But the survival curve is, some, is again, something that we will also be doing in the future. All right, great.